All right. Um, are we good, Ashley? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Well, uh, hello everyone, and warm, warm welcome to this um, session uh, of SNAV uh, career development uh, events. Uh, I'm really pleased to uh, co-host this session with my colleague Tom Dredanks. Uh, and today we have the honor to uh, welcome Dr. Russell. Uh, who is coming um, from Penn University as assistant professor. Uh, she is leading a very successful program over there, um, mainly focusing on extracellular vesicles uh, in the context of stress and pregnancy, but also doing um, some neuroinflammatory uh, mechanisms uh, that are involved. Um, and she did uh, her transition to professorship in a fairly very short period of time within a, a one year postdoc experience, which is amazing. Uh, so today we are here to uh, hear about all of this uh, and getting some insights and tips from you. So thank you again, Ashley, for joining us and for accepting our conversation. Uh, our invitation, not conversation. <laughs> and we're looking forward to hear from you. Um, so please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Tanina. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to come and have a conversation with you guys today. So um, I'm excited to talk about my career path so far, um, mainly focusing on that transition into a more teaching focused position while still doing research. So the title of my talk is from postdoc to professorship, navigating the transition with teaching excellence. So the outline for how I'm going to kind of talk through today is that I will start by just kind of going through my educational background and talking about the different opportunities that I've taken along the way um, to get more experience with teaching and just kind of talking in front of people. Um, even to this day, I still get a little nervous when I first start talking. I just need a little bit of time to like ease into it. So even though that's like my job now is to just talk in front of people, there's always that little bit of like anxiety right before you start. But the more you do it, the better you get at it. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit today as well. Um, teaching opportunities on here twice. So lots of teaching opportunities I've taken. And then I'll talk about the job application process and what the interview looked like for the job that I have now. And talk a little bit about work-life balance because I think that's a really important consideration to make when you are looking for positions that you're planning on being in long-term. Are you gonna be happy with what you're doing? Um, because having work-life balance, at least for me, is extremely important. So that was a major factor in considering where I wanted to go next. So um, starting off with my undergraduate education, I've had a really weird career path. Every time I tell people how I started and where I got to where I was, I'm always met with puzzled looks, but it makes sense to me. So I figured I would share it today. Um, so I started off at Penn State Barron, which is a Commonwealth campus of the Penn State University system. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I started off as an undecided major, um, kind of bebopped around a little bit, took classes in like engineering, finance, really just didn't know what I wanted to do for a long period of time. Um, and then I started taking some psychology classes and I thought that the brain was the coolest thing ever. So I did my bachelor's degree um, in psychology and I knew that I didn't want to you know, sit around and kind of ask people how they're feeling all day. You know, counseling wasn't for me. I think it's a really important job, but that's just not something I could see myself doing. I was really more interested in understanding how the brain works. Why are people feeling the way they're feeling? Why are they thinking the way that they're thinking? So I decided to try and piecewise myself a neuroscience degree because uh, we did not have that at Penn State Barron. So I did a minor in biology and started taking more um, science focused classes. And then um, when I was an undergraduate, 
I did have the opportunity to be a teaching assistant for an introductory psychology research methods class. So that was really my first time ever teaching. Mostly I just kind of walked around the room and helped students out with their projects. But I also had the opportunity to give a full on lecture, which was really scary at the time as an undergraduate. Um, I was a senior lecturing to sophomores and juniors. It's really overwhelming, but I kind of really enjoyed doing it. I kind of found my jive after a little bit and things started to feel good as I continued on. Um, while I was there, I also mentored two students specifically in research. So when I was an undergraduate, um, I got involved in faculty research and my own capstone research project. Um, I, they I tried to tailor them a little bit more neuroscience-y, but it was still very much psychology focused. Um, while I was an undergraduate, I got experience with grant writing. So I wrote and was awarded six undergraduate research grants. So these were internal to Behrend, not like national level or anything like that. And I took every single opportunity that presented itself to me to give presentations. So while I was an undergrad, I was on 11 posters and I gave one oral presentation. So I very much became a yes man whenever it came to talking about research, because the more that you talk about it, the better you're going to be at it. So I started early with this, still not really knowing what I was going to do, but knowing that being able to develop those soft skills of talking about what I do and explaining it to other people was really important for wherever I was going to go. So I started working on those kind of early on. After that, um, I went to West Virginia University to do my PhD in neuroscience, specifically focusing on the role of extracellular vesicles in neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration. Um, and I also took many opportunities to do teaching while I was in graduate school as well. So I know some graduate programs do require their graduate assistants to teach. Mine did not, but I sought out those opportunities and made sure that I found them and was able to participate in them. So I um, was a TA for a medical neurobiology class. So teaching neuroanatomy essentially to medical students. And then I also coordinated that class as a graduate student for all of the graduate students that had to take it after I took it. So I got to sit in on faculty meetings with all of the faculty that lectured within that class, talking about how we wanted to set up the course, where we thought different pieces of material fit the best, how to talk about neuroscience in general, neuroanatomy to medical students. And so this was a really great opportunity for me to see how faculty approach teaching. And so this was really kind of a, a turning point for me that really started to plant those seeds that maybe teaching is what I wanna do. I really enjoyed that entire experience that I had. Um, aside from that, I also lectured in a graduate student class focusing on the fundamentals of neuroscience where I got to put together my own lectures. Um, I wrote quizzes, I did assessments with the students and I actually got student evaluations, which I think was really helpful for when I went on the job market to have you know, hard evidence that I'm not just wanting to teach, but I'm actually good at it. Or at least a couple students that I lectured to thought I was good at it. Um, while I was there, I also mentored three students, so learning how to navigate teaching other students how to do research, which is a really important skill to have. Um, and then in my graduate education, um, I didn't get any grants specifically for my research, but I was awarded a research fellowship as part of a T32 training program, which was really helpful um, in learning a lot of really awesome things and got a lot of opportunities coming my way through that fellowship. And then I also, again, yes man to every single opportunity that presented itself. I did 18 posters and 12 oral presentations during my five and a half years as a graduate student. Like literally every single opportunity that arose, I said yes to. Didn't matter where it was, as long as my PI was willing to send me I was going to do it. The first oral presentation I ever gave in graduate school, I went to a conference all by myself. I flew all the way from West Virginia to California alone 
I gave my presentation alone. It was at a vesicle meeting. I knew no one. And it was probably one of the scariest moments of my life. But it was also really reassuring that I can do hard things if I just do it and put my mind to it. And so can all of you. So as long as you believe in yourself and just put yourself out there, things will get better. You'll get better at it. And you will develop those skills that you need to in order to talk about your research and talk to a large audience of people. So after that, uh, I went on to Johns Hopkins to do my postdoctoral training. Um, I was in Ken Whitworth's lab with Tanina and Tom, so it's nice to see some friendly faces again. Um, while I was there, I did work on a teaching certificate from the Center for Integration of Research, Teaching, and Learning, or CERTL. I almost completed it. The last part that I needed to do was in-person teaching of an undergraduate class. And then COVID hit, and I never stepped foot on Hopkins premises again because of the lockdown. And I had already started searching for the position that I'm in now. So I was not able to finish my teaching certificate, but I did all of the other components, all of the trainings associated with it. And while I was there, um, I also presented two posters and mentored three students. So after that, um, I started applying for jobs about a year into my postdoc. I knew I really wanted to do more teaching and I wanted to start looking for opportunities that would allow me to do that. That's really where I started fi figuring out my calling. I didn't want to be in the lab all day, every day. I still wanted to be able to do research, but I didn't want that to be my life. So the way that I found out about the position that I have now, which is technically an assistant professor of biochemistry and molecular biology, was that I was driving home from work. Well, I was getting ready to drive home from work. And I had an hour commute from the Hopkins campus to my house, which I also did not love and was a big push for me to kind of move on to the next phase of things. I did not love living in the city and neither did my husband. Um, I was getting ready to pull out of the parking garage and I would call my parents every day because I would be so bored sitting in bumper to bumper traffic. And my dad was always watching the news because that's what dads do, right? And so he said, hey, did you see that Penn State Barron, which is where I did my undergraduate degree, is starting this new partnership with McGee Women's Research Institute, which is the largest institute in the country focusing solely on women's health. And I said, no, dad, I don't have the same news as you. I don't know what you're talking about. What What is this? And he kind of explained that there's two job openings. He didn't fully understand it. Um, so I was like, okay, let me call you back. And so I Googled it and I see that there's two positions open in at Penn State Barron. And before I called my dad, I called my husband and I said, hey, how do you feel about possibly moving to Erie? That's my hometown. That's where I did my undergraduate degree. What do you think? And he said, anything to get us out of Baltimore, let's go. So uh, that night I went home and I looked at the job application and I started thinking, is this something that I could do? Throughout my career, I always just said yes and went for things, even if I didn't think I was going to get it. I still tried. And I'm so happy that I did because I just went for this job. So a little bit about Penn State Barron. It is a Commonwealth campus of the Penn State system, which means that we are not located at University Park. We're not tied to a medical school. We mostly just have undergraduates. I think we have master's in business administration and master's in clinical psychology, maybe a couple, one or two engineering programs, but that's really the extent of the uh, master's or graduate students in general that we have on our campus. So I knew that it was going to be a weird transition if I was able to get this job going from working in you know, high impact labs with ties to medical centers to something that is very, very different from that. Um, but I still wanted to go for it. So the application materials that I needed to put together were pretty straightforward, cover letter, research plan, teaching philosophy, and curriculum or my CV, right? So I would say that my cover letter 
research plan and teaching philosophy were all equally important in flagging my application to really even be looked at. So my cover letter mostly was explaining, you know, hey, I'm really interested in this job, kind of some very key pointed things that would make me the best candidate for this job. Very straightforward. My research plan, I had to get creative in how I would be able to execute the type of research that I do at an undergraduate campus. So in the job ad, they explained that they were building a new biomedical research facility and it would have capabilities for cell culture and some other things that I knew were in my wheelhouse. So I really played up to what I saw in the job ad. And I said, you know, cell culture is something that I could absolutely teach an undergraduate student to do. I could use my startup funds by myself, either in ultra centrifuge um, or a size exclusion chromatography setup, and I could still study extracellular vesicles. We can do some Western blotting. I can probably do some PCR. Like, I can put together a research plan and make it applicable to undergraduates, which was something that I made sure I very much articulated in my research plan. And then my teaching philosophy, I kind of pulled from experiences that I had throughout my undergraduate career, throughout my graduate career, and through the teaching certificate that I was working on throughout my postdoc, really making sure that I was explaining what I thought was the best approach for teaching for me and how the experiences that I previously had shaped all of that. And then my CV was just, you know, my CV. And one other thing that I did that I think helped was I sent a direct email to the hiring manager. So at the end of the job ad, that if there's any questions or concerns, contact this guy who turned out to be my boss. And I sent him an email and said, hi, I'm very interested in applying for this position. I am just kind of making sure that it's still open because the job ad was a little on the older side. So I was afraid that they'd already been through the process of hiring people. Told them that I was very, very, very interested in this job. And I also sprinkled some seeds in there that, you know, I graduated from Penn State Barron and I would love to give back to my old community and help this place grow in a new area because we did not have any sort of biomedical research going on at Barron prior to these positions being created. And he responded, I think like the next day and was just like, yeah, the job is still open. We're still looking for people. If you are interested, please get your application in soon. Um, so we were trying to move forward with the interview process. And so I got everything together and I set it in within the next couple of days. And then I was contacted for an interview. So I put this cartoon in. Um, where do you see yourself in five years? And the guy says, probably by the water cooler. Um, don't mind all the watermarks. I totally did not steal this off the internet. Um, but I thought that it was really relevant because this was kind of the approach that I took when I was in the interview. When asked, where do you see yourself in five years? I saw myself at Barron. I saw myself by the water cooler with my colleagues talking about different ways to teach, different ways to do research, possible collaborations. I saw myself there. It wasn't this nebulous thing of, oh, I see myself teaching at a four-year institution and having a very successful research program. It was, I saw myself doing those things specifically at Barron, living my normal life by the water cooler at Barron with my new colleagues here. So the interview process first consisted of a phone interview where I was basically just put on speakerphone and had to answer questions from people that were in like a conference room together, um, asking about my interest in the position, what my teaching philosophy was, and why Barron. So essentially reiterating everything that I put in my application package, just verbally. Then they brought me in for an in-person interview. Um, I gave a job talk, which was essentially a research overview. So I talked about what I have done previously and what my plans would be at Penn State Barron and how I would actually integrate undergraduate students into my research program. Um, I think that that's a really important thing to consider if you are interested in working at a primarily undergraduate institution is 
how are you going to make what you do work without graduate students, without postdocs, potentially without technicians? How are you going to do this type of work, which is very intensive, right? Cell culture, if you work with human samples, it can be very intensive with long hours. How are you going to get that to work with undergraduates? Um, and then I also had various interviews throughout the day with potential colleagues and then different people in leadership throughout the campus. Um, they all kind of asked the same questions, like why Barron? How are you going to engage with students? How is your research program going to work here with undergraduates? And just making sure that you have a way to talk through questions that you're likely going to have is really important, obviously, for interviews. So I think interview practice is important. Um, I had done some practice interviewing and I had done my job talk with the woman who runs the CERTL program when I was at Hopkins. So it was really nice to be able to have the opportunity to practice some of these things instead of going into it cold. So I would definitely recommend working with whatever institute that looks like for you to practice those things because it can be really overwhelming. I still had a couple like deer in the headlight moments when people asked me off the wall questions, but you just got to let your brain process it, pick yourself up and move on. And then after that, um, I received my offer and I was able to negotiate um, different salary and startup funds and specifically equipment that I knew that I would want that my startup funds wouldn't cover, like an ultra centrifuge. Um, I was also able to negotiate a Zeta view, um, making sure that we had two cell culture hoods since they were going to be hiring two faculty. So making sure that I had what I knew I needed to be successful was a really important part of the negotiation because it's one thing to get the job and it's a whole nother to be able to keep the job, right? So if I'm saying I'm going to be doing X, Y, and Z research, but if I don't have a cell culture hood or I don't have a way to separate my EVs from whatever fluid I'm working with, not really going to be very successful, right? So if you get to the negotiation place, you really just need to make sure that what they're offering to give you is going to be enough. And I did question that a little bit. I was wondering, you know, am I going to be successful with these things? I don't have the same access to core facilities that people have when they're directly tied to a medical center. You know, it was a little scary going into it, but I felt pretty confident with what I did get throughout my negotiation. Um, in terms of startup and equipment that I felt comfortable taking the job. So we moved on and then went through the acceptance and hiring process. So what my job looks like now, it is a tenure track position. Um, technically, I'm expected to spend 45% of my time teaching, 45% of my time doing research, and 10% of my time doing service. So teaching, as you would expect, teaching lectures, teaching labs, things of that nature. And mentoring students in research also falls under the teaching umbrella because you are taking someone who has no idea how to run a Western blot and teaching them how to run a Western blot, right? So that still falls under teaching. Um, and then research, general things, right? Presenting at conferences, publishing, um, one thing I will say is that at my institution, at least, I don't have to only publish original research. I do need to publish work that I've done here at Barron specifically, but other things like review articles or book chapters still do help count towards my tenure application. And so they are still important, right? Writing a review article is not something that's easy and it's not something you can do overnight. It still takes a lot of work, just like original research. And so we are rewarded for that as well. Um, you get a little bit more of a reward when you do have an actual original research paper though. And then um, another thing is that I am not required to obtain a grant, which to be honest is a big sigh of relief because funding is very hard to get, right? And so I have to walk a fine line of ensuring that I'm getting research done 
in order to publish and I'm not eating through all of my startup and I'm being strategic in where I do apply for funding, right? So I need to look for things that are more geared towards undergraduate campuses and understanding that I am not going to have a team of postdocs executing the work that I'm proposing. It's me and some undergraduate students in a lab between their classes, right? So it is a little tricky. Um, so I'm not required to obtain funding, but it's definitely encouraged that we should at least try. And then the last part of my job is service. So this is both to my profession and to Penn State. So that can look like reviewing papers or manuscripts or reviewing grants, um, serving as chairs for sessions at conferences, and then working on committees at Penn State, um, just really anything that doesn't fit into the research and teaching category probably fits into service somehow. So in my first year, I did not have any work-life balance. All I did was work because I was setting up new classes and trying to figure out my lab. So the new class preps really drained all of my time. And that was because I was figuring out which textbooks to use. Once I figured out which textbook I wanted to use, I had to read through the textbook. Then I had to put lectures together. And then I had to make sure that I was meeting the proper learning objectives. So it was a ton of work that I poured into that whole first year of prepping three brand new classes that had never been taught at Barron before. So it's not like I could have asked another colleague, hey, you've taught this class before. You mind sharing with me your old material? materials. I had to do it all from scratch. So that was a lot. Um, and setting up my lab was also a lot. The department that I'm in is technically the Department of Biology. And myself and the other person who was hired at the same time, we are really the first and only people doing any sort of biomedical research. And so navigating that was a little challenging, um, trying to figure out what exactly we needed when there wasn't any more experienced colleagues to ask for mentorship like hey you think this is going to be enough what do you think what do you have can I borrow this piece of equipment I mean there's some shared equipment because it is biology but it was a little challenging to navigate that and just setting up a lab in general is not an easy feat and then just setting up the physical lab is one thing but also finding good students to work in your lab and help you with your research is a whole nother beast um, I'm still trying to navigate that, but I'm getting, I'm getting a lot better at it. So when I first started, I was letting pretty much anyone and their mother come kind of work with me, basically shadow me around the lab. I'd give them some papers to read and, and under the understanding that I knew that they wouldn't fully grasp everything they're reading, right? But still starting to try to foster that mentor-mentee relationship. And I found that a lot of students don't understand what research is, and that's fine. They haven't had the opportunity to do it before. And so now I tell every single student that knocks on my office door that they're interested in doing research, that they can shadow for the first semester, they can see what research is actually like. And if they decide that they don't like it, no harm, no foul. I hope to see you in a class in the future. No hard feelings. It's all good. Some students just don't understand that you're not in the lab having eureka moment after eureka moment after eureka moment, right? Cell culture is a lot of like hurry up and wait. So is Western blots. So are doing PCRs, right? That is a lot of you put some stuff together and then you let it sit. Then you put some stuff together and you let it sit. And some students are totally fine with that. And others, that's just not what they want. And that's totally fine, totally fine. Um, but figuring out how to find good students and how to appropriately run a, a lab with only undergraduates was very challenging. And I'm still figuring it out. And I think a lot of my colleagues are still figuring it out because it's it's not easy, right? You have students that can't come during the morning on one day of the week, but their whole morning's free the next day. And then the next day, their morning's all blocked up. And so how do you navigate 24 hour time points with things? So it can be a little challenging to really figure out how to set up projects that are rigorous and done in a scientifically sound manner when you only have undergraduates. 
but you have to kind of build a team. So I mostly have students working in partners or pairs or small groups so that if one person starts an experiment, another one can come in. Or if I start an experiment, a student can come in and finish it or vice versa. So it's very much a team effort and not necessarily one student working on one project in a silo, right? They're working together. And so I think that that helps to foster good communication skills among the students themselves, as well as just good note keeping, good um, uh, experimental design, just making sure that we understand all of the steps in the whole process and work together as a team to execute it. Um, it was also challenging the first year to find collaborators. You know, you come in all bright eyed and bushy tailed and you're like, I'm going to do all of these amazing things. I'm going to have all of these collaborators. And then reality hits you that you have to prep all of these classes and navigate all of the other things associated with research that maybe you need to rein it in a little bit and not be so uh, gung ho about finding all these collaborations right off the start until you figure out your own footing in your space. And then you can move on to find people to work with you. And then um, it was also challenging to navigate all of the, we call it blue and white tape instead of red tape. Um, but just setting up things in the lab that you have to have when you're starting a new lab, like biosafety protocols, making sure that everything is approved before you start. And then if you have new people coming in, that they're doing all of the required trainings and they get added to your safety protocol. And if you're doing any human subjects research, figuring out your IRBs and getting those approved and navigating that whole system, it can be very overwhelming. And it definitely ate up a lot of my time in the first year. But I think all of the work that I put into finding my feet in that first year has really paid off because my work-life balance in year two and beyond, I'm in my fourth year now, is so much better. It's so much better. It's night and day. So my class preps are much simpler. I have had experience prepping new classes and I have been able to teach most of the same classes for multiple semesters. And so I tweak things here and there for sure, but the backbone of my class is pretty much the same all the way through. So I can almost recycle some stuff with moderate tweaking to update it every semester. I found it much easier to identify students that want to do research and aren't just doing it because um, their advisor told them that doing research would be great to get them into medical school. So they show up to my lab a handful of times and think that that's enough, right? I want students who are interested in what we're doing, even if they do wanna go on to medical school, that's great, but I want them to still be interested and committed to doing research and not just putting this as a line on their CV. Um, finding collaborators has been much easier now because I have figured out what I can do here um, who people are, you know, I started during the fall of 2020. So COVID made it very challenging to meet new colleagues and identify what people do and how we could kind of interface in new and creative ways. Being there for a couple of years has made that a lot easier. Um, funding, I have gotten several different internal grants um, I've also been awarded some seed grants between Penn State and McGee Women's Research Institute for some collaborative research projects. Um, I've put some external grants out that have unfortunately not been successful, but, you know, still trying. Um, but things are a lot better now. Um, I definitely feel like I can step away most evenings. I can step away most weekends. I try to structure my days in ways that give me opportunities to do the writing that I need to do, do any class prep that I need to do, do any grading that I need to do, and still have time to spend with my family. So I, I don't have to worry as much about getting, you know, an R01 to keep my family afloat as well as all of my lab um, personnel's families afloat. That is not something that I wanted to, to deal with. Um, I could not deal with the anxiety of having to worry about that. Um, I think it's great that other people can, but that's just not something that was 
in my future for me, what I wanted to do. So like I said, I have very good work-life balance at this point. Year one, I was up until like two or three o'clock in the morning every night working on things. I would be the professor where a student would email at like two in the morning and I would respond and they're like, oh my God, Dr. Russell, why are you awake? And I'm like, same reason as you, I got to get stuff done. Year two, if you email me after like six o'clock, I'm not going to respond until, you know, the next day. I have normal working hours for the most part, and I try to hold very clear boundaries when it comes to that. And I think that that's really important as well. Um, so the types of research that I am able to do here, like I've kind of already mentioned, is cell culture based work. So things are definitely a lot slower with just undergraduates. Um, but this is generally where I have students working on projects as cell culture based projects. I've been able to get one methods paper out, one review article out, and now I also have a original article in prep, all with student authors, which is great. Um, I also have been initiating some human-based research projects in collaboration with McGee Women's Research Institute and some investigators there. Um, so we're still kind of in the beginning phases of that, but I'm excited to be able to do not only cell culture, but also human-based research. Um, I also have some really other or some other really cool collaborations that I don't think I would have had at a larger institution where all of my colleagues are also doing cell culture-based work or human-based work. It's really just me and the other person that was hired. So if I want to collaborate with people at Barrand itself, we have to be creative. So I have a collaboration with chemistry where um, my colleague is synthesizing very specific chemicals that inhibit a specific enzyme in Alzheimer's disease. And we are treating some neurons with that compound or those compounds um, to see how it affects cell viability. Um, I also have some collaborations with engineering where we're manipulating, well, we, they, I don't know how to do any of this, but they're manipulating the polymer surface of different plastics and we're seeing how cells can interact with them, hopefully with the goal of looking at how cells may differentially change their EV profiles, and then collaborations with McGee Women's Research Institute. So just things that I never thought that I would have the opportunity to do are presenting themselves because of the place that I'm at and the colleagues that I do have around me. And then um, something that I'm really excited about is pedagogical research. So I had no experience in this whatsoever prior to starting my job, but I have gotten involved in several different projects. So one was looking at new grading schemas for in the classroom. Um, it was in a big cohort of faculty from different campuses across the Penn State system looking at different ways of grading. And from that, we have two papers in preparation that we're getting ready to submit. And then I'm also leading a project where we are looking at the use of technology in classrooms. So I wrote a small grant and was able to purchase iPads for several faculty to utilize for teaching to determine if faculty-led technology use impacts student learning, retention, excitement, engagement, motivation, um, and hopefully we'll be able to get something out of that. We just started it this semester. So lots of opportunities that I would never have imagined presenting themselves, have presented themselves, and I absolutely love it. I love what I do every single day. I, I couldn't be happier with the position that I'm in and the type of work that I get to do every day. The students are fun. Some days they make me feel very, very old because they don't get references that I try to give them. Then no one knows what jello jigglers are. I try to compare the gel that you use for running a Western blot to jello jigglers. Nobody ever knows what I'm talking about. I talk about size exclusion chromatography, sort of how like on the price is right where you drop the Plinko chip and it bounces down. Half of the, pit, the kids that I have don't know what that is. And then I feel ancient. Um, but then other times I feel like they help keep me young because I get to interact with the youth and help them learn about science and become passionate and excited about things that they had never even heard of before. So with that, I think I'm going to stop and I can take any questions that anyone may have. Thank you, Ashley, for this uh, wonderful talk.
going all the way from your uh, your personal experience uh, getting into research to your current job. So uh, thanks for uh, giving all the details. I'm, I'm sure there are uh, people who have lots of questions. There's a first question in the chat already, so I'm going to uh, read it. Um, the question is, how do you pull a research project from start to finish with just undergrad students? Because undergrad students uh, may come for just a semester, so they may not have enough time to finish uh, the project. So what is your uh, view on that? Can you get things wrapped up in a limited amount of time, or do you spread it out? How does it work? It's, ch it's definitely challenging. So I've found that it's best to spread things out and work on things in very small snippets. Um, whenever students first show interest in joining the lab, I just have them come shadow for that first semester to really give them a feel for, is this something that you want to continue doing? And if it is, generally those students tend to stay. Um, I've only had, I think, one or two that decide to stay then leave. That's usually when they transfer to the larger campus, the University Park campus, that I'll, I'll lose them to that. But in general, those committed students will make it through that first semester of shadowing. It's kind of like a test almost. Um, and then they'll stay. And so it is challenging to get things done with undergraduates. But in the last year and a half, I was able to hire a technician and that has really changed the game for everything because she can help me um, making sure that time points are met and that if I'm teaching class during a time period where students are able to come into the lab, she can help navigate making sure that they understood what they needed to do. So that has really helped a lot. But before I had her, it was all me just trying to navigate it. And it was hard, but we did it. Yeah, I, I understand. So you have uh, they, these students do this in between their classes you mentioned. Um, so you have certain times a day where you may expect students coming in and, and you plan your experiments around that. Okay. For the most part, yeah. Okay. Because uh, at least in the in the Netherlands, we don't have this kind of system. So this is this is new to me and maybe also to some of the listeners. Um, then uh, Marcos uh, Faso Vera uh, asks um, a lot of questions. So how do you know how difficult it is to get a teaching research position if you need a visa uh, sponsorship? How does that work in your institution? I have no idea. I'm sorry, I can't speak to no. that. I know that there were some rules that recently got changed now that COVID is a little less pressing um but i don't know exactly what it looks like i can shame in here very quickly as an international postdoc uh and uh, on the job market as well so there is definitely ways to get an h1b visa um you just need to really apply ahead of time before your j1 basically hit the five years mark and also see that your institution uh, or the institution that you're applying to um, can sponsor that. Um, there is no like one rule fits all. So you really need to approach the Office of International Services of each institution and see what the rules are. Um, but there is definitely ways around it. And I have seen assistant professors and their H-1B visa before uh, getting the green card ready. Uh, but again, this is not Atroni advice. This is just based on experience. So please um, check with the legal team or uh, your institution. And then a uh, second question. I, I think I do, so I'm going to go through all of them because that will uh, be very one-sided. But um, did you have a very specific research plan for your under undergrads when you applied for the position? Or were they more interested in the research, uh, no, sorry, the teaching part of your CV? I think they were interested in both pretty equally. I think that they were very curious of how I was planning on conducting biomedical research with undergraduates. So I made sure in my job talk that I really honed in on that. I did have a kind of a specific plan. I had, I think, two specific aims for cell culture projects. 
But I had to keep in mind the place that I was going. Like I said, no one else did the type of work that I was doing. So I, I needed to make sure that what I was talking about could be understood in layman's terms, right? So I couldn't get up there and just be like, extracellular vesicles and nucleic acids and da 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 when I have colleagues that work mostly in ecology or, you know, um, agriculture sciences. You know, I needed to make sure that what I was saying would make sense to basically everyone. So I had to very much tailor what I was saying to a more general audience while still articulating that what I was planning to do could work. So it was a delicate balance, but that's just something that you have to consider when you're planning on applying for primarily undergraduate institutions is you might be the only one with that specialty that you're bringing to the table. That makes sense. Thanks. Maybe I'll get back to the other questions if we have uh, more time. Um, and here's a question from Jonas Barre. Um, what would you say, in your own opinion, was the best thing that prepared you for the jump between postdoc and professorship? I think that the teaching certificate and the mentoring that I did was really, really important. Um, you know, getting through graduate school and getting into a postdoc, I think demonstrate that you do have skill in research, but generally you don't get any formal training in teaching and mentorship. So if you can show that you do have that skill set, I think that that makes you definitely more marketable for the type of position that I'm in where it's not just research. Nice. Then Kelsey Ramsey is asking about uh, the negotiation uh, process. So how do you know how much you can uh, push for what they're offering you and how to walk the line between advocating for what you need and not asking too much. Can you share some advice for us? Yeah, that was tough. So when I got my original, um, I guess it's in two different brackets, right? One is like my salary and my teaching load and the other was startup and equipment. So for salary and teaching load, um, I was not super happy with my original offer. And so I looked to see if there was any public information about what general salaries are at my institution. And I counter offered with something that was closer, a little above the average. And then we kind of negotiated from there. And I was able to bump my salary up a little bit from that. And I was more comfortable with where I was at after kind of talking through that. Um, class load was not something I could really negotiate, excuse me, negotiate. Um, it just kind of is what it is. I will say that there are things that you can do to lower your teaching load. Like this academic year, I'm on a research fellowship. So I'm only teaching one class each semester instead of two to three. So that's made things a lot easier to get research done. Um, and then in terms of equipment, um, I just kind of laid it out on the table. You know, if I want to be able to do the type of research that I do, like EV and cell culture based work, this is the stuff that I need. And if the institution can't necessarily provide that for you, it might not be the right place for you. Because if you can't do the type of work that you you know you can do, how are you going to be able to be successful? Um, I was fortunate that through their partnership with McGee Women's Research Institute, there was an influx of cash to be able to purchase equipment and build up this new brand new lab. So I was able to kind of push for a little bit more than what I might have been able to in a different scenario. Um, but, you know, I, I said, I want all of this stuff. And they said, that's nice. We can give you some of this stuff or we can meet you kind of in the middle with, with this budget. And then I was able to say, okay, I might not need like all of this to be successful. I could be successful with this and maybe write an equipment grant, which I was able to do. So for example, I, I said I had a Zeta view that wasn't part of my original startup. I was able to write a small equipment grant um, through a local foundation that was able to fund that. Um, so there's ways to get additional equipment, but if you know that there are potential collaborators, you could send your samples to. So you don't necessarily have to have a Zeta view in-house. Try to think about those things and get creative. I think being creative is a really important part of this job too, because you're not going to have everything at your disposal. So you have to figure out unique ways to, to accomplish what you need to accomplish. 
great. That's a that's a very good answer. Uh, next, uh, Krishna Pavani is asking, um, as an international, can you explain how to best attain a professorship in the U.S.? Uh, where to start, and can an international apply for from for grants from abroad? I don't know a whole lot about the international process, unfortunately, so I I can't really speak to that. Um, but I I would say that if you are interested in the type of position that I have, where you're doing both teaching and research get as much experience in those areas as you can especially teaching because like I said your PhD and your postdoc that shows that you're good at research right we're all good at research we, we're all here together we're all good at research we all know how to do it teaching and mentorship is a completely different beast that if you don't have that training in seek it out and work on those skills a little bit and it'll make you more marketable Thanks. Um, Ada asked uh, whether you had a good mentor that uh, who helped you with the interviews or at the beginning of your tenure position. I just kind of did it all on my own. Um, I did reach out to my um, graduate thesis supervisor to kind of practice some interview questions because I... Um, was doing my presentation with the majority of my research from graduate school since I'd only been in my postdoc for about a year when I was going to interview. So I wanted to run it through him since the majority of the stuff was what I had done in his lab. And he had worked with me for five and a half years. He knew me very, very well. Um, but we didn't do a whole lot of practicing it was just like a handful of times I mostly worked with the woman who ran the teaching certificate program to to do my practicing which again I would definitely recommend practicing interviewing and practicing your job talk in front of people for sure yeah exactly there are some questions you know they're going to ask and then you need to have your answers ready right mm -hmm. nice then uh, Muhammad uh, Nawaz is asking, uh, since your program is primarily an undergraduate school, how do you plan to supervise PhDs, postdocs for future transition to senior level, but you cannot have it here? You would want to transition to next level at some stage, but is this not possible at your current place? Um, so <laughs> it's being at a primarily undergraduate institution, I will likely never have PhD students. And so that's just not part of the requirements for tenure for me. So I need to be excellent is the, the criteria, excellent in teaching, excellent in research and excellent in service. And so that's gonna look very different than someone who's at an R1 institution, right? Those are people who need to be having graduate students move through their lab, having postdocs come in and move on to, to uh, the next level in their career. For me, it is, mentoring undergraduate students, helping them get into either medical school or graduate school or some other form of professional school or finding a job if they don't want to move on to the next level of schooling. And then also um, publishing papers. So I don't necessarily have to have um, undergraduate stu or PhD students in order to be promoted to associate professor here. We have full professors as well that have never supervised a PhD student um, in an official capacity. There are some situations where faculty here can serve on committees through the broader Penn State system that does have PhD students. I know of a couple that have done that, but it's not a requirement. That's very clear. Um, I also had a question myself uh, about uh, teaching uh, philo uh, philosophy. If I ever want to get a teaching uh, certificate myself, I also need to say something about it. But it, to me, it sounds like a very uh, big world, word, like as if you need to reinvent the wheel or something. So uh, how was your approach to uh, doing that? And uh, you mentioned there were some uh, past experiences that, that uh, helped you on this. So um, how, how did you tackle this and how big should you should your philosophy be? That's a great question. So um, in terms of size, my philosophy was a one page paper. <laughs> but in terms of like philosophical size, um, I mostly just focused on how I think students learn the best and how I can convey that information to a student. 
And so for me, I think that the best way that students learn is through active learning. So instead of me just standing at the top of the classroom and just talking at students forever and being like, okay, see you at the exam day, bye-bye, you know, making sure that they're engaging with their material through different ways, um, asking them questions in class, having them try to take on a little bit more ownership of their, excuse me, of their learning and not just being passive, just sitting in a desk, right? And so I talked about um, experiences that I had mostly in graduate school um, when I was TAing the neurobiology class that I mentioned earlier. The faculty who led that class did some of the coolest stuff I've ever seen. So when he was talking about um, the vascular system, for example, and the circle of Willis and how if one artery gets occluded, that can change where in the brain the stroke occurs. He had a giant balloon figurine that he made and he would pop different balloons and he would talk about, you know, if this artery gets occluded, what does that do? So I, I kind of pulled from that, not necessarily talking about how he taught, but ideas that I got from those experiences. So I might engage students with physical manipulations of things in the classroom, so something along those lines. Okay, great, thanks. Um, there's one more question in the chat. Maybe it's a good one to uh, round it up. So looking back, is there anything you wish you had known or done differently during your job search or early days in your faculty position? Um, I think just believing in myself and just going for it. I had put in applications at a couple other places and I it was just crickets. I never heard anything back. I had emailed those people, the hiring managers, asking them questions, and I never heard anything back. And it was kind of a downer to just be ignored. But I think that's pretty commonplace. So just continuing to go for it and not getting discouraged when you do get either rejections or just complete being ignored. Um, just keep going because you, you're you going to find something. There's always good jobs for good people. So you'll find something somewhere you just have to keep pushing nice those are wise words to uh, end of uh, this session i think so thanks a lot uh, ashley for your time it was a really um, uh, inspiring talk i think for uh, a lot of people um do you also want to say uh, something tanina no just like to stress what you just said it was a really fantastic talk and very inspiring and I'm so happy uh, that we made it. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing all the details. Thank you for having me. I hope that you all found this helpful. And if you have any questions, please, by all means, feel free to reach out to me via email. I'm more than happy to, to talk at length about really anything. <laughs> Great. Thank Thanks. you, everyone, we, for joining we us. Couldn't go through, we couldn't go through all the questions. So if there are any questions remaining, please uh, email Ashley uh, directly. Thanks a lot for joining. <laughs> Thank you. See you. I want to stay for a couple of seconds.